So let me drop it in here one more time and see if it will go. Can you see it now? It's downloading. It's just a PDF with some notes on it, um, uh, just to fill in the blank. So, okay. So I know that we are in limited time. And so I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Amanda, let me know if you can see it now. It's kind of like once you join, then we put it in there. So um, if you aren't able to get to that and you're wanting to, just let us know and we'll try and troubleshoot that for you. So, um, okay, so we're going to jump right in. I have a bunch to share. I was telling <laughs> before we went live, I was like, I'm going to try to not talk too fast in my excitement. Um, I'm passionate about what we get to cover today. So there's the PDF for your notes. Um, to help you remember and um, it's kind of like a little fill in. And today's topic, the three must have to thrive in today's hustle culture, both personally and in your coaching practice. So we're gonna be putting on a couple different hats today. We're gonna look at it through the lens of you personally and ways that you could grow and develop and then also how you could help your clients grow and develop. And so if some of these concepts are kind of um, you've worked through them yourself, I want to challenge you to really take a look and think about, okay, how could I utilize this process to help my clients? Um, so today we're going to be on mission to reimagine coaching by banishing hustle culture to truly thrive. We have to dig deep within ourselves and help our clients to do the same. So with that understanding um, that it's not how fast that we get out there and start digging, right? Because we can make all sorts of little holes everywhere, but it's really how deep we dig to really make that impact. So to get started, we're going to talk about two definitions to really kind of get us both all on the same page. Um, we all know the ICF defines coaching as partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. The process of coaching often, often unlocks previously untapped resources of imagination, productivity, and leadership. But one that we might be less um, aware of is like, what is the idea? We've heard of hustle. We've heard of side hustles. What is hustle culture? It's a lifestyle where career has become such a priority in your life or in the environment that you work in that other aspects of being human, such as hobbies, family time, and self-care often take a back seat. So who does that resonate with? Anybody been there, been part of an organization? You've actually just done it to yourself in some aspects. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. Um, and this is a big part of what I cover in my programs as we try to banish that hustle culture where we have to go, 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 keep our no, the proverbial nose to the grindstone. Okay, so now that we have a shared understanding of the definition of coaching, the hustle culture red flags, um, let's dive into today's three main points. Keeping in mind, we're on mission to banish hustle culture and truly thrive as we dig deep into ourselves and into and helping our clients to do the same. So the first main point, and you'll see this on your notes, is a mindset reset. And there's a couple different areas that we're going to look at. I could go in a hundred different directions, um, but for today, um, to really be able to dig deep and just kind of get us started, we are only going to have time to discuss some key high levels. So reset, and A would be reset your definition of success. If it's all about financial reward, then it's too narrow. So success is liking yourself, liking what you do, and liking how you do it, according to Maya Angelou. So this definition becomes your why, and, and Simon Sinek put it famously, your why becomes your motivation for doing what you do. And so what does that look like as you are processing through those thoughts? And then I want to also challenge you as you dig deep into your own personal uh, definition of success to remember your process because that's what will help your clients to be able to dig deep and discover theirs too. So um, comment in the chat if you have a definition for success. 
I know some of you have already done this work. Um, and so we'd love to hear from you and what, what would be your definition or some broad ideas of success for you? Yes, I love that, happiness. Yes, my clients get value from our sessions, yes. Clients having breakthrough and able to thrive, yes. So creating that impact in the world through our work is part of our success story, right? And then we're gonna talk about a few other things. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you for adding that in, um, Coach Carmen. The success um, to meet the goals uh, you set for yourself. Yeah. And that can be personally and professionally, financially. So good. Okay. So if we didn't, if you didn't have like a real clear definition, let's, we can start by jotting down what matters most and what you think life would look like once you're successful, once we're in that place. And then you start and, and then you will, um, excuse me, you get to start on defining your definition of success as you move forward. Yes, Pamela, freedom. And that can be freedom in time. That can be freedom in, um, in uh, like margin, or it can also be financial freedom. Okay. So for this next one, we're going to put on our thinking caps. What's one thing? Here's the question. What's one thing that unites us all on the same level? So we might all have different educational backgrounds, career backgrounds, certifications, life experiences, but what is one thing we all have in common? Go ahead and put in the chat what you think. Yes, our humanity. That's good. Not the one that I'm looking for, but that is true. We all are human. We want to help people. We want to create a loving impact. Yes. Yes to all of those things. Anything else? Yes, we all have joy in suffering. I love this because there's so many things that we all have in common. Yes. Colleen, if I had a, um, <laughs> If I had a reward, it's finite time. And so time is the answer here. Taxes. Yes, Amanda, we all have to pay our taxes. But with we all are, stay, are caught within the same restraints of 24 hours. Hustle culture will tell us, get up early, hustle all day. You can do it all, have it all but that simply isn't true. So the next one that we have to talk about is be reset how you relate to time. A quote from David Allen from his book, Getting Things Done, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. <laughs> and I, that is so true. We have to prioritize because we all only have 24 hours in our day. And to top it off, our bodies are not designed to go, 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 but to have rhythms of work and rest. And I dive really deep into this when I'm working with my clients, because we find our value in our work a lot of times and don't understand and aren't aware of the value of rest. Uh, Jordan Rayner in his book, Redeeming Your Time, outlines a rhythm of a 90 minute deep work with 15 to 30 minute break and then repeating the cycle so that you can stay on top of your creativity without being exhausted. He goes on to say that depth requires two ingredients. So the first one is focus and the second is time. He mentions that he can do three cycles. So this, this three 90 minute cycles, um, and then he's done for the day. And so as I've practiced with this, I can do two cycles before I'm completely spent. Um, and for me to do more would mean that I have no energy to give um, to my family at the, end of, at the end of the day. He then gives us this encouragement. Remember, focus is a muscle. It builds over time, start small, add more weight to the bar as you focus, as your focus muscle develops. 
Um, I believe the same is true in coaching. To go deep with our clients, we have to dig deep by asking powerful questions while remembering that the coaching continues long after the session has ended. So we have the same ingredients needed for depth at work here too. So focus would, would be powerful questions plus time not only during the session and utilizing the power of silence, but also the time between sessions that we can really utilize to be able to fully help them develop. Therefore, one powerful question I like to ask at the beginning of a session is what came up with you since our last session? And oftentimes I'm surprised and delighted to hear about um, what my clients have continued to process and create since our last session. So in the mindset, under point one, after defining success and resetting how we relate to time, the next and possibly the most important is to reset your thoughts. Psychologists have been telling us that our thoughts determine our feelings, which determine our actions, which is really the root of all cognitive behavioral therapy, or some people refer to it as CBT. Um, is helping people to change their thoughts so they feel better and then make better decisions and take better actions. Um, in coaching, we call it mindset model, and there's a variety of them out there. But in a nutshell, what you think about determines how you feel and how you feel determines how you act and or your responses, which results in your life results. So how many of you are familiar with that concept or model? Just Put, throw a yes in the chat. Okay, perfect. Great, yes. And so this is kind of the root of a lot of our coaching is really helping create that awareness so that they can change one, of the, one or two of those factors. So in relation to this model, questions I like to ask my, my clients when digging deep into mindset is, how would it feel to think about this differently? What are the facts about this situation? And oftentimes we can reverse engineer a better, more aligned response for future discussions and or situations by starting with the result or negative income outcome of a situation and working backwards. So reverse engineering this model has helped me create deeper awareness within myself and take 100 percent responsibility for my responses and results. So in our family, we have this motto, my response is my responsibility. And oftentimes my teenagers were like, yeah, 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 I know, mom, my response, my responsibility. I got it. <laughs> it has become definitely an ingrained core um, motto. Okay. So once we've been uh, completed our mindset reset. If we find we're still not seeing those thriving results, then it's time to, and in point two, it's incorporate sanity systems. Now I love systems, but I'm totally not a um, technology guru. Who's with me on that? <laughs> I love to systematize, make things simple, love that efficiency, um, but it's not necessarily the case um, for everyone. So these have to be really simple for them to work with me uh, so that you spend less time on things that don't really matter and more things that do. And one of these um, came about um, when I was in HR. And so in HR, I had all of these open tabs as um, David Allen would call it. And it was all of these open tabs and I couldn't keep track of all my projects, much less all my home things. And so it was just this constant thing. And that was like a drain for my time and energy because I was trying to keep track of them in my mind. And so I started using a system and there's lots out there. There are a million and I discover more as I work with my clients and we co-create systems that work specifically for them. Um, but the idea is that it makes it so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, so uh, in business, this might mean using a system for signing a client agreement and receiving payments all in one in a one step process. Okay. So then the next part of my sanity systems is building routines. And um, 
Greg McCown and the author of Essentialism, he wrote, the right routines give us the equivalent of an energy rebate. Instead of spending our limited supply of discipline or time on making the same decisions again and again, embedding our decisions into our routine allows us to channel that discipline towards some other essential activity. And I'm thinking, who wouldn't want an energy rebate, right? Um, that's what I was needing when I was a single working mom. Um, Jordan Rayner in Redeeming Your Time says, if you think about it, time management might be more accurately described as energy man management. Every decision we make expends more energy. So I'm curious, what energy saving routines do you have? Go ahead and drop them in the chat. Do you have some that just save you a ton of time? Okay, well, I don't see any in here. Your calendar, perfect. Oh, preparation of our pre-planned meals. Yes, that's one of mine also. I use my Trello to pre-plan my meals. Like no more survey of like, what's for dinner? What should we have for dinner? <laughs> A breath work, cold therapy center for focus. Love it. Um, I'm curious, um, Carmen, for your calendar. That's great. Do you time block your time then? Okay, so yes, there's all of those that keep you from having to redo it. And so I use my Trello once a month. I prepare the whole month for based on our schedule. And then I um, have all my recipes and everything in there. And so since it's in my um, Trello app, it's with me all the time. It saves me a bunch of time to be able to um, go to the grocery store only once a week not and not have all that energy that gets stored up. I don't know if you guys have had that brain leak where it's like thinking about something, thinking about something, that brain clutter that's kind of running in the back. It's almost like when your system programs are running in the background and you're like, um, I'm really kind of thinking about this, but I'm trying to focus. And so as soon as I get everything into that system, instead of running that background, I am able to become calm and clear and uh, my creativity and focus can return. Um, and so you might, as I'm talking up Trello, I am not an affiliate marketer. And um, it's just a system that really works for me that I enjoy getting to share with other people. Okay, so the third and final must have to banish hustle culture and truly thrive as we dig uh, deep within ourselves and help our clients to do the same is three is establish boundaries. A definition of a boundary from Henry Cloud, he defines boundary, boundaries define us. They define what is me and what is not me. A boundary shows me where I end and someone else begins, leading me to a sense of ownership, knowing that I am to own and take responsibility for gives me freedom. Taking responsibility for my life opens up many different options. Boundaries help keep the good in and the bad out. Setting boundaries inevitably involves taking responsibility for your choices. You are the one who makes them. You are the one who must live with their consequences. And you are the one who may be keeping yourself from making the choices you could be happy with. So that's Henry Cloud from Boundaries. How to, when to say yes, how to say no, and take control of your life, which has had a huge impact on me. So we need to honor and respect our own boundaries. If we don't have them, we won't be able to stick to our schedule, routines, or stay focused on projects because something or someone will always be pulling our attention to create good boundaries. You will need to know the following. A would be know your values. B, know your priorities. Once you know your values, then you know how to prioritize to live those values. We don't have time to dig deep into all of these, but hopefully this will spark some discovery and some places to look as you start internalizing what your boundaries should be and where they might be lacking. Um, create a freedom schedule. What does it need to look like so that you can incorporate more than work into your life? What does life work balance look like for you? Um, 
I love creating these with people because it incorporates what they value and love into each and every day so they can live wildly productive, intentional, and satisfying lives um, while avoiding burnout, uh, which is a huge thing um, today. Um, I have tools that I use uh, with clients to clarify their values so they can live them and not simply profess them and not live in that contradiction schedule. I say I value this and I want to choose this, but I'm kind of not, and really aligning their priorities um, to create their own freedom schedule. Okay, um, so in conjunction with our ICF theme for the week, let's reimagine the future of culture coaching by banishing hustle culture, by slowing down to be able to dig deep into resetting mindsets, incorporating sanity systems, establishing boundaries within ourselves and our clients. So together we will thrive. I just really thank you for your time and attention today. And I look forward to your questions at the end of our time together. Thank you, Becky. That was great. Thank you so very much. And I have written down a couple of questions, so thank you. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we'll shift over to the second of our presenters today, um, Marcy Almond. Hi, Marcy. Hello. <laughs> so Marcy is a coach who helps women going through a transition or who have experienced trauma find their own truth. Her life experiences help her find common ground with clients in order to be able to offer the most effective coaching for their journey. Thank you for being us, with us here today, Marcy, and I'll hand it over to you now. Welcome. Okay, well, thank you for having me. I, um, after talking with Becky on the phone, I was really excited that we got paired together because we both are very much focused on mindset. Um, and my whole thing I wanted to talk about today is I'm going to tell you a little, my story, a little bit of it, um, because my story is what drove me to um, who I coach, why I coach them. Um, and I think when you tie it all together, it um, shows you how you can thrive as a coach, but it, I'm also gonna talk about how, just much like Becky did, you can help your clients thrive um, through the systems that I use. So a little bit about me, first of all, I um, was a athlete, huge athlete. I've been an athlete since I was very, very young. And I did not realize how much of being an athlete really kind of made up my whole identity. And um, in 2015, I went in for a abdominal hysterectomy and it went very, very wrong. Uh, they put three holes in my small intestine. They did not know it. They sewed me back up. And three days later, they were doing emergency surgery to save my life. I ended up with a collapsed lung. They had to pull, I was septic, so they had to pull all my insides out, clean them out, put them back in. Um, ended up with pleurisy. I mean, it was a big deal. I um, almost died. And I ended up staying in the hospital for two weeks as they were trying to save me. And it was a really traumatic and dark, dark time in my life. And, um, you know, my husband was with me the whole way, um, but it affected every area of my life, not just physically, it affected me mentally, emotionally, it affected my marriage, my profession, my hobbies. I mean, it affected every area of my life and um, it took me down a really dark road. And through that though, I um, started discovering some processes and um, different things that can help you through when you're going through a life transition. I lost my identity. I did not know who I was anymore because I no longer could do um, the athletic things I was doing prior to that. Prior to that, I was a powder puff football quarterback. I was the MVP. I was leading my team. And now all of a sudden that was gone. And so there are a lot of transitions in life. There's, you know, divorces, there's moving, there's changing jobs, there's, you know, just a new relationship. There's all these transitions. And when you go through transitions or when you go through trauma, because trauma is trauma, we all have different kinds of trauma as well. Um, there are, um, I call them the foundational principles that I have discovered that you have to 
go through those to shift your mindset in order to be able to thrive and move forward in life. And so that um, helped me develop what I went through, helped me develop my foundation for my coaching practice. And because I'm getting older, I like acronyms because they help me remember things. And so um, I developed an acronym that goes along with the name of my company. So the name of my company is Unchained Journey, because when you are um, going through a transition or any type of trauma, you can feel held back and chained and like you cannot move forward. And um, that is where I was when all of this happened to me. Um, so much so that I hardly left the house. I had panic attacks. Um, my husband would try to get me to go on hikes and I would just have these meltdowns. And um, he said to me one day, he said, um, I don't understand where my wife, the fighter is. What happened to her? And that made me, well, actually it crushed me, but it just made me kind of step back and go, okay, what is going on here? What do I need to do to work through this? And so the very first thing I discovered was you have to listen. Um, you have to learn to listen to the small voice. So um, all of us are familiar with that loud voice that's in our head. I mean, it says things to you like, you can't do it. It's too hard. You're not smart enough. You don't have the talent. It says all of these things. And this loud voice, um, it, it can keep you so stuck because it overpowers everything else and it affects your mindset. So when it's constantly telling you, no, you can't do that. Oh, no, you're going to get hurt, which is what I heard a lot because it took me a long time to recover from all of my injuries and the thought of getting hurt again and going back into the hospital or having to see the doctor, it froze me. And so learning that there's actually more than the loud voice in your head. There's actually a small voice in your head as well. And so you have to learn to shift your mindset and slow down. We live in this world where we just go, 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 go all the time. And that loud voice is so easy to listen to because it's the loud one and you're going, going, going. And so the loud voice is just there, 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 and you're used to it. So you just keep right on going. You don't stop, slow down and focus and, and try to find that small voice there that is saying, yes, you can, you can succeed. Just try one time, just take one step forward. You will get it. That small voice is really quiet, but it's the positive voice. And so with my clients, and maybe you guys have even experienced this as well, you have to help them discover that small voice and, and discontinue or start pushing out that loud voice that's always there. Um, and I think that part of our problem in our society now is that there's all this social media out there. There's all these things that even when we start to slow down, instead of like focusing on that small voice, we immediately pull up that phone you know, we pip, pip, get up on our computer and we get on these things that um, keep us from finding the small voice. So I forgot to tell you, I jumped right into here and I forgot to tell you, the acronym is LINK, like L-I-N-K, you know, like a chain link. When you break one of those, then it allows you to go forward. So the first letter I just talked about was L, um, learning to listen to the small voice. Um, so then the next letter is um, inviting growth. So we can all talk about how we want growth. And when you talk about it to your client, they may be like, whoa, 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 growth is painful. You know, growth, I, I could fail at it. I don't want growth is hard. I don't want to do that. Um, and it's our job to help them see that growth can actually be positive. It can be full of joy. It can be, um, it can be what helps them um, develop new um, practices and techniques, kind of like Becky was talking about. And so our job is to help them um, 
embrace growth and invite growth. Because I can say all day long that I want growth, but unless I actually say, okay, yes, growth, bring it on. Let's, let's do it. I'm, I'm ready for it. It's not going to happen. And so as a coach and as even as myself during my process, um, when I thought of growth, it, it sometimes made me uh, panic, like I talked before, because growth to me at that point in my life was that I had to find who I was now because I didn't know who I was now um, because everything I had been previously was now gone. And so I had to grow and seek this new person. And it was scary and um, frustrating. Um, but as I put one step in front of the other, as I would choose just one little thing to work on, I realized that there were still things out there that could bring me joy. There were things that I could focus on instead of focusing on what I didn't have anymore. Um, I have one client. Um, she was really, really scared of growth because she was really comfortable where she was, even though it didn't satisfy her. And um, she was afraid of failure, which same thing as me. I was afraid of failure. I, you know, uh, discovered that that's a big thing for me. And so this client, same thing, we were kind of working through it. And I started saying, well, why don't you just try one small thing? If you could just do one little thing, what would that be? And so she chose something and that went well. So then she was willing to try something else. So just helping her work through just those little steps instead of looking at it as, oh, well, I'm going to lose 50 pounds in a month. Well, why don't we talk about, let's just meal plan some healthy meals for a week for the first step. Or um, this client that I had, she wanted to start a new business, but she was really comfortable where she were, was. And so she just started doing one little tiny step at a time. And as she started seeing that growth, it encouraged her uh, to take another step and another step. And the amazing thing is now, after only a few months, she has started the new business. She's not just where she wanted to get. She's beyond that and continuing um, to thrive just because she was willing to take one little step. And it's our job to help our clients see that growth doesn't have to be scary or negative. It can just be one little step at a time that is positive, that can just shift their mind. Um, their mindset and help them thrive. So the third letter in link is in. So we hear a lot about nurturing, but, um, and I like to talk about nurturing yourself. Um, and this is not um, selfish nurturing. Um, and I think that a lot of times when we hear nurturing, um, well, for me, when I first think of nurturing, I always think of children, you know, you nurture children and how they grow. But what I like to ask my clients is, who do they nurture? And most of the time, they'll say something like, well, my spouse, my kids, my coworkers, my friends, but they don't mention themselves. So then I said, so how do you nurture themselves, yourself? And a lot of times they just pause and they don't even know how to answer that question. And so our job is to help them discover ways that they would feel nurtured. So uh, another client that I have, when I asked her that question, she had no answer, none. She was a single mom. She had four children. She had nurtured those children. She had developed her own profession, her own business and taking care of her children. She never nurtured herself. So I said, well, so if you got to do one thing for yourself right now that would bring you joy or comfort or happiness, what would you do? She had no answer. And I sat there. I did not speak. Mouth shut. And I just sat there waiting for her to come up with something. Nothing. It was the saddest thing to me that she couldn't even, I mean, do you like to take a bubble bath? Do you want to go to lunch with a friend? Will a cup of hot anything that would nurture yourself, nothing, nothing. So we worked through that. But um, what I try to tell my clients is 
you know, if you imagine a cup, if you have a cup and you're, you know, doing a little nurturing over here to your husband, and then you go and get a, a chai latte for your friend and you take it to her to work. And then you go and you help your child with their homework, you're nurturing. Well, every time you nurture, you're taking something out of your cup and your cup is getting more empty. So pretty soon, if you nurture, 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 and you never, ever nurture yourself, what is going back into the cup that is allowing you to continue to nurture others? Now, you can nurture others when your cup is empty, but it's not going to be you're not going to nurture as well. It's going to drag you down. It's going to drain you. So if you don't nurture yourself, if you don't get your a cup of tea and have your quiet time where you're writing in a journal the things you're grateful for, or if you don't get together with your friend and have lunch, or if you don't take a bubble bath at night and read, that's my nurturing. Those things all fill up your cup. And the more you fill up the cup, the more you're able to give to others. And it's going to be good nurturing that you're giving. It's going to be your best nurturing. Um, so then the fourth thing is K. Um, and this could be the one you have to do first with your clients. It just depends on where they're at. And that is kicking the past to the curb. So I will tell you, I seriously was stuck in the past because all I could focus on was what had been done to me, why it happened to me, what I had lost, what I no longer had. I was stuck in this negative mindset that was drawing me down and keeping me stuck. And I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of clients and even not even clients, a lot of people I know, we love to stay in the past. Why? Because it gives us an excuse to stay exactly where we are. It gives us an excuse to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that because, you know, I grew up in a childhood home where this happened and this happened. There's no way I can get past this. And I'm telling you that because I grew up in a hugely dysfunctional home. So I know how that works. So we have to choose to kick the past to the curb. We have to choose it. We have to decide it. Now we may falter. We may all of a sudden pull it up, but as coaches, we can just, we can say to our client, you know, one of the things you had discussed with me was you did not want to go back to the past. Do you feel like right now that's something you're doing? And does that align with the direction we're going? You know, you can refocus them. Um, but I think the past, this, the, the, even though it's the last letter in the acronym, sometimes that's the one that we have to um, go back to um, and do that one first. So how does all of this relate to you as coaches if you've already worked through all of these things? So for me, um, when I was deciding who I was going to work with and what direction I wanted my coaching business to go through, um, I started looking at my experiences, my professions, my hobbies, different things in life that I had gone through. And I decided that as a coach, for me, um, um, all of those things should determine who I coached, should determine um, what my um, coaching uh, philosophies were, um, what um, the direction of my business was that I wanted um, to go. So my first piece of advice for all coaches would be that if you look at all of those things in your life, you can use those things to help other people, whether they have been a traumatic experience, whether it's been a success you have had. I mean, I was a successful real estate agent. I have been a huge leader. I am a professional. I could have chosen any of those things, but none of those things really um, made me passionate. And I felt like uh, what I had learned in life could help me be a better coach. So when you're thinking of what you want to do as a coach, 
you should take all of that into consideration and choose those things because it'll help you develop your um, business. It'll help you develop your vision, uh, your vision statement, your niche or your specialty. Um, those experiences in life, I feel, are given to us for a reason and they can help us to be better coaches. Um, so I know that that can be a little bit different than what some people out there say. You know, um, they talk about, well, you can make money in this type of coaching or, um, you know, this is the highest demand type of a coach. But I feel like when you choose those paths for your coaching, what's going to happen when on those days when you just don't want to coach, you just don't feel like it. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, um, if your mindset is not a mindset of passion and helping people thrive, what's going to help you keep coaching that day? Um, the second thing I would say is that don't let anybody else influence um, what you decide to coach. I had a mentee who was an engineering student. I'm mean, not student. I'm sorry. In, um, engineering professional. And so she was going to coach engineering professionals. But every time I talked to her, she would talk about her extreme athletic um, competition she had just did. And the other girl that was there that she coached that day. And man, she would just like light up and she was so excited and she had this bubbly personality. But then when she turned that off and she'd start talking about, well, I'm struggling to figure out my um, vision statement for my engineering clients, she just like all of a sudden was, Bleh, you know, and I just was like, wait a minute, have you thought about coaching extreme athletes? And she's like, oh, well, I already have an Instagram page and I have, I don't know, 1500 followers. And I was like, well, what are you doing? You know, she, and she goes, well, my mom told me that I should coach engineering and I was like oh my gosh you need to think about this for a minute and so she started working through it and realized the false beliefs that had built up because of what someone else had said um so um let's see here I think I'm about there but um one thing the, the reason I bring all of this up from my story to the program I've developed to what I feel is probably the most important thing to do as a coach when you very first start and even if you need to transition if you're finding that you're in a place where like you're just drained and you don't feel like you want to keep coaching maybe you need to address who you're coaching and why you're coaching and if you can do that i feel that as coaches and as our clients if you can do all of that that will help shift your own mindset it will shift your clients mindset sets and everybody will be thriving so anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you for listening. Wonderful. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you so very much. I love that last question. I feel like anybody could put their profession in there, right? Right. Why am I showing up? Why and who? You know, that's that's a great grounding question. Well, so we do have some time here at the end. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to just unmute and ask or you can raise your hand, whatever feels comfortable for you, or even type it in the chat and we're happy to read it for you too. So take a couple moments to process that and see what, what you notice, what questions arise for you for either Becky or Marcy. Maybe, I'm not seeing anybody yet. I'll go ahead and get started while people are thinking. And I was wondering, Becky, when you're working with your clients and thinking about this, I love that sanity system. It's just kind of a catchy saying, but um, where do you see people? Where's a, a great way to start with that? Personal level or work, or it doesn't really matter. Where do you see most people tend to start when they try to get a sanity system going? Mm -hmm. Wherever their biggest struggle is showing up. <laughs> so sometimes it is work. Uh, I, I didn't get to get into some of the um, backstory for me, but um, I was a single mom and I was trying to do it all. And then I was showing up at home kind of in that thought pattern, right? The results were not what I wanted. I didn't have the energy to connect with my children, much less make dinner and do all the things, right? And so that was my biggest problem, but it kind of spilled over. 
because I was trying to carry all of those things that I had from HR to home. <laughs> like they're still running in the background, draining my energy. And so I kind of look at it like a bucket that has a hole in it. <laughs> and I had to fill that first. So whatever one is like the biggest nagging problem, we start there and then we build. And then pretty soon, like myself, we just began to um, incorporate it everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. And I think uh, Coach Carmen was wondering that you had a, a quote about practicing or living values. Do you remember what that was back on that part, Becky? Um, I don't remember if I had a quote, but we were talking about when we have an, a value. So one of my highest values that you probably heard coming through is responsibility, right? So my response is my responsibility. So what I was kind of giving you was an idea of when you're not living, like when we're living contradictory. So we might've seen this in organizations. They say that they really value customer service, but your experience is completely different. That's the same in our personal. It's like, oh, um, yesterday we had a um, situation and I'll just use a very new raw one. My middle son is graduating from high school. Saturday. And I find out yesterday that no graduations at 630, not, or it's not at 630. It is now at 11 and I have an event prior to that. <laughs> and so some of my responses <laughs> were not the best responses. And I had to take hundred percent responsibility for that owning my own frustration and irritation because we've got 30 people coming into town from different states <laughs> to be there for it. So when we're not living, because that's when I started to feel it, there's like, ugh, that pit in your stomach helps you to realize that you're not living in, in alignment with that. And you have to go back and kind of fix it and make it right. So more of it, it wasn't really a quote from anybody uh, specifically, just understanding that when we're out of alignment, that's what it kind of feels like. Interesting. Kind of reminds me of the small voice that you were talking about, Marcy. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much. And I, if I could just say, I appreciate that because I'm always thinking about value systems. And with me always thinking about value systems, practicing and living that is very important, but I never thought of it in the context that you had discussed it. So even when you're talking about businesses and things of that nature, because they have to, you know, establish missions and values. And if they're not promoting that or like living that or practicing that, I found that to be very profound and mm -hmm. it just stuck with me. And I want to, you know, potentially use that thought process a little bit deeper in what it is that I'm trying to do as a coach as well. So thanks so much. I just wanted to say that. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you, Carmen. Mm, yes. Thank you, Carmen. I think that you're onto something. It makes me think even just about that's really at the core of a lot of burnout too, right? The things we can't control in our organizations when they're not living true to their values or what they say. Huge observation. Anybody else? Are you seeing anybody, Chris, or? No, no, that's, I think you've covered them all. I, I, I would go back, Marcy, I, I your comment at the end about address who you are coaching and why you are why you are coaching and i think um maybe it was amber or someone said i think that applies in any profession really i, I do some uh, career transition coaching and the question that i like to ask people right at the beginning is you know what, what is it you really want to do because so many, i had one guy recently who had been um, he'd been an accountant for 29 years and he was looking for another job as an accountant. And I, when I asked him what he was looking for, he said, I don't really want a job as an accountant. I hate it. But it's what my father-in-law told me I had to do when I married my wife. And now we're separated, so he's not in my life anymore. And he's now he's actually now working in, a, in an animal shelter, working with animals, which is what he always wanted to do. But it was just discovering that passion. And I think if we all, all ask ourselves that question, we might find that we're doing something, uh, you know, there's something different in front of us that we that we will do much better because we feel passionate about him because it aligns with our you know with our hearts and our values to to becky's point so it was a to me it was the a very profound comment that came out there i loved it thank you and i forgot to mention um because i was getting i was looking at the time and i'm like oh i'm running out of time 
but that's what my entire coaching um, business revolves around. The number one thing I have done my entire life that I've been passionate about is helping women thrive, be confident, and move forward in life. Um, because I have found there's so many women that did not get that as a child growing up. They didn't have that encouragement. They didn't mm -hmm. have that someone behind them telling them all the time, you can do whatever you want. You can be whoever you want. And um, so I am so passionate about women. So taking that and combining it with my experiences was the perfect fit for me in my coaching business. That's so good. And I would add one more uh, quote by uh, Simon Sinek. He said, working hard for something that we don't care about mm -hmm. is called stress. Working hard for something we love is called passion. And so when I'm feeling stressed about it, something, that can be the question of like, am I working for something that I really am not caring about? And how do I transition that to really channel that en energy to towards my passion and helping in those ways? Kent, would you like to ask Marcy that question? Sorry, Pamela, carry on. Oh, I had a question. Um, like we were talking earlier about, well, we're talking about stress. Are there and systems to relieve that stress? Are there other things other than Trello that people use that would be helpful? <laughs> Are or, you asking or just yeah, for just electronic systems? Or are you asking any kind of system? System, any kind of systems at all? Okay. Anything. Yeah. So there's a ton of other ones and I, I can't think of all of them, but um, there's lots of different ones that are kind of the same list making. You can kind of Google that list making um, uh, apps and stuff. Um, and then also I have found uh, for relieving stress is journaling. If just getting out a journal and like really kind of getting clear about what you're frustrated over because it helps me to draw that picture. And I also journal with the model that we were talking about and um, what we think about how we're feeling. And so, and then those results. And so it might not have gotten to the result yet, um, but I know I'm feeling off and it's not a way I want to feel. And so I can journal about, you know, why I might be feeling that and what I might be thinking mm -hmm. to really kind of help reverse engineer a better thought that I can be having about the situation and mm -hmm. then feel better about it and then have a better response in the, in the alternative. Is that helpful? That is. And I had one other question in the very beginning of your talk, you were talking about the, um, what coaches do. And that is that from the website, from the ICF website, or is that? Oh, the definition of coaching. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's from the ICF. Oh, okay. Website. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Thank you. So Pamela, hopefully that will help you with your lion taming career as well. <laughs> <laughs> Kent, you had a question for Marcy. Yeah, uh, I was just curious if you were familiar with Mastin Kip. A lot of what you brought up, he <laughs> he talks a lot about in his book as far as um, you know, sourcing traumas, not letting traumas, you know, control our you know, our day-to-day -day experience, stuff like that, but definitely a lot of overlapping uh, principles that you talked about. Somebody you, I mean, you might be interested in. Oh, reading. interesting. Yeah, I'll read it. I'll, I'll look it up. Is, is there a title of his book? Um, he, his, uh, I believe it's, shoot, I could Google it real quick. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I'll, I'll Google him, but thank you. Yeah, no, it's a uh, it was definitely very helpful for me. Um, it's Claim Your Power is the book that I read of his. Um, but he does a lot of journaling with the book. So Becky, that kind of falls in with what you do, uh, what you just transcribe as far as, you know, using a, journaling as a form of source, you know, trauma sourcing and then working towards resolution as far as present day things. But thanks. I appreciate it. Emily. Yeah, no, no further questions in the chat. Um, Amber. All right, sounds wonderful. Well, Becky, Marcy, thank you so much. And thank you guys for being with us and for your questions and all the resourcing that was happening today. Loved it.
Um, please be in touch if you have any further questions. Um, Chris, myself, Becky's on coming on the board here too, which will be great. Um, and so we invite you to join us Friday for our final presentation for this week's international coaching. You can go to icfhighcountry.org and register for that event if you haven't already. Um, hope to see you there. If not, we meet monthly. Always please feel free to join us. Um, we'd love to see you. So be well. Thank you so much, everyone. Chris, do you want to say something? Well, yes, one, one of the things. So we've, we have events like this. These are for International Coaching Week. But we do run events every the second Friday of each month, which will also get you, unlike today, where there are no uh, CEUs, if you attend our Friday events, you will get a, you'll get CEUs um, and they're terrific value if you're a member. And I know many of you on here are members uh, for the thirty five or fifty dollars you pay for the year. You're going to get you're going to cover your costs of those sessions very, very quickly. Uh, but please come along. Feel free to join us. Uh, Amber mentioned the website. If you're there, then stop by and join us if you haven't already done so. And we, we'd love to have you as members. Thank you. Were the other sessions recorded uh, also? Yes. Uh, yes, all, all sessions have been recorded. Excellent. Okay, thank you. I missed the okay, first they're, two. they're on the website. So thank I, you. Amber, the chance to mention earlier. If you go to the ICF High Country website, click on the, on the YouTube icon in the top left-hand corner, and that will take you to all those sessions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Be well, everyone. Good to see yes. you. Bye.